Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Backline with Rob and Adam. My name is Adam Colley, alumnus of the Second City main stage. And my name is Rob Norman. I'm author of the cool improv book, Improvising Now, A Practical Guide to Modern Improv. Rob, how would you feel if your book got a review the way you describe it? If someone wrote, cool. Uh, like, like a cool? Like a review. If they yeah, just wrote, like, this is a cool. The cool improv book, Improvising Now, A Practical Guide to Modern Improv. I would love yeah. that review. That's such a generous... What if they put cool in uh, air quotes? Um, so if you put air quotes like on paper, it's just a uh -huh. quote. Was it called? A well, they're still. It was, it was yeah, actually invented still in for the, the air. Word. It's still well, like not in the air. around. They're not in the air. Yeah, they're, but you can write something, but then the you air. add. Okay, so Rob, we just came back from Dallas. Um, you and I tour very differently, as everyone knows. Um, so I want to hear what is your Dallas recap? What are some highlights? What are some lowlights? What are some midlights? Uh, the our Dallas trip was was filled with highlights for me. I got to do my number one favorite thing, which was visit a new comedy theater. And boy, is is um, the Dallas Comedy Club one heck of a theater. Uh, there's two spaces, two performance spaces, lots of classrooms. Uh, I I can't imagine a facility that large and that well maintained. Um, in a place like Toronto, there would just be no space for it. There, you couldn't afford to to create a, a a comedy, an improv comedy theater that that's that is that sprawling. Um, outside of something like the Second City, this is just yeah. Two even that, who, like yeah, yeah. The the bar like they have a wonderful bar but then they also have the massive patio like a huge patio like hundreds huge of people patio. can fit out there yeah and it's it's strange because hanging out there before shows or after shows you're out on that patio and you're like this is actually kind of fun and that's a very unusual thing to be at a comedy theater in their bar on their patio and be like i like this space just on its own Normally you're like, oh, the, the beers are four bucks and all my friends are here, so I'll stick around. But this is actually a place where you're like, oh, you, you might actually go there on purpose. You know, like <laughs> it's nice. It's a very nice place. Um, and that was the only thing that you enjoyed there. I mean, I've been very clear what my agenda is while, while on tour. I want mm -hmm. to meet improvisers and I want to see the mm -hmm. improv theater. Um, as for Texas, lots of things I liked about Texas. Um, we stayed in a neighborhood called Deep Elm, which is an exaggeration of the word Elm, which I thought was real interesting. Uh, I guess when folks moved to Texas, they were like, oh, there's a street called Elm Street. And the way they pronounced it, they, they said Elm with just like a little little bit of a kick to it, you know? And uh -huh. this whole new word, which was Elm. So I thought that was really neat. What about you, AC? Um yeah we kind of did the um a lot of walking which i love love mm -hmm. just like peeking around a corner and seeing um lots of different fun architecture it felt like there's an area in toronto called kensington market heard of it and uh deep ellum felt very much like that or like venice beach just kind of a lot of independently owned unique shops lots of murals lots of walkability great we had great tacos and we had huge barbecue Mm -hmm. Man, I was like, this barbecue place, I'm not a big barbecue boy, but Rob, you really wanted this, and it was quite the experience. And um, the the aggressive politeness, I think, was so fun, because we have a passive-aggressive politeness in Toronto, in Canada, and it was like, I asked, the, I had a question about some sort of sausage. I was like, oh, can I, like get half of this sausage and half of this. And they're like, sorry, can't do that. And I was like, no, no problem. I'll get this one. He's like, no, you know what? I'm going to give you both. Here you go. And here's these sauces. You're going to take them and like them. And like, they're genuinely serious. And I was like, this is such a lovely thing. And we ate so much meat that mm -hmm. I was uncomfortable in the middle of the night. But when you go, you got to get that meat. And we did. And it was lovely. When um, you go, you got to get that meat. You got to get that meat. You gotta get that. Um, and uh, talking of touring, coming up, 
the weekend of June 24, 25, 26, we'll be in San Diego uh, doing some workshops, doing some shows uh, with Finest City Improv. So you can check out uh, doing a workshop on sketch, doing a workshop on sustaining scenes. And I think um, they're actually almost sold out, which is awesome. So if you're interested in um, coming to have a hang, uh, check out Finest City Improv. And if you have suggestions of things that we need to eat or do in San Diego, um, pass them along. Because I want to hear about that cobblestone. I want to hear about those tiny old bars. And I want to hear about that food. Rob's rolling his eyes constantly. I would never. No, 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 no. Um, so, Rob, we tour. We get to meet a lot of different improvisers. We get to see how people handle their community. We get to see how people handle their kinds of shows and what each community is like. And um, we got an interesting question in the old backline mailbag that I thought I would bring to your attention because it's a, it's not a typical improv question. It's more of a question surrounding improv. I wanted to get your thoughts. Cool. So this is from our friend Sachin from Toronto. And uh, Sachin wrote in with this. Rob, you ready? I'm ready. What are different types of improvisers? Do you think that everyone inclines to become one type over the others based on their personality type? And I read this and I thought, huh, you and I know quite a few improvisers. We know them on stage and off stage. And some people like doing a scene with them is like hanging out with them. It's the exact same person on stage, off stage. And some people, it's like, you're a chameleon. Your personality and your on stage presence are completely different. So what do you think about this? Uh, are there different types? Do you think your personality informs what kind of improviser you are? depending on training, background, experience. What do you think? One million percent, I think it does. And I think also, although it does inform what kind of improviser you start as, you can also expand outside of that type. Um, so one of the things that I, I notice a lot, I, I've heard this problem a lot. It, it's about um, improvisers who seem to be doing all of the right things, but for some reason just can't find the pocket. They can't find the fun. They're talking too much. They're explaining too much. And my first question is always, by any chance, are, does your family have three kids in it? Like, are, are you the, the one of three kids? And usually the answer really? is yes. Yeah. Okay. And then I go, are you the oldest of those three? And they'll go, absolutely. And I'll go, I think this is what's happening. You spent your entire life taking care of other people, making sure everything was set up so other people could succeed. I'm the youngest of three. So I'm not walking into scenes going, oh, is everyone okay? Because I just assume it'll be done for me, right? Because my <laughs> older brother, my older sister would just take care of it. There'll be a lunch. I'm, when I was five or six, I ran, we were at the cottage, and I ran down the dock and I just jumped off. And I almost drowned. And my sister was watching me, ran in, and just pulled me out with one arm. But if she hadn't have been there, I would be dead. That's just my whole life. Just be like, oh, cool. I'll just jump into the lake, and I'm sure someone that's, will take care of it. That's so funny, because I've <laughs> never thought of that. But that is you. Yeah. You're just, you'll show up, and you'll just be like, it'll be fine. Yeah. And I'm the youngest, but divorced parents neglectful older brother when he was younger i gotta mm -hmm. take care of it mm -hmm. and so when i see someone like you i'm like how are you not preparing how are you not getting ready for all this that's so funny that you the the jumping off the dock is the exact metaphor for who you are mm -hmm. but one thing that's interesting you're talking about chameleons on stage i would say for you as an improviser your improv personality and your real personality are very different from each other. They feel very different. Because on stage, you are very much a collaborator. I would say like you're the kind of player that kind of comes in second and is like, I don't care what you do. I'm going to add on to it and make it even funnier. That's just your general energy. But off stage, you're very much like, oh, I've got to take care of everything. I've got to have everything planned out, which is interesting to me. It's, it's almost like 
there are rules within improv that allow you not to worry about something going wrong. Yeah. Like I think in life, like when we, let's say you and I are going on a tour, mm -hmm. the idea of leaving that city and then learning about something I should have done kills me. It's like, oh, I can't, I, I could have had that experience. And if I had just done a little research, I could have done it. And so I know that my interests aren't shared by everyone. So I'm like, if I want to see this, I got to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And on stage, it's like, well, there's no goal, right? There's nothing that I'm going to miss out on if I don't do. So it is a free space. It is a space where I can put my needs aside and just say, the only need I have is to have me and you f do something together. Um, and it is a very freeing place. Because as, an, as a, a leader usually in life, to take a back seat and just say, I'm so comfortable with you taking a lead that it's, it's comforting. It's relaxing. You're a leader in life? Yeah. Hmm. Robbie, you might be frozen. Because you're no. just, you, oh, no, you, you kind of had a long pause. Maybe I was written. Um, okay, well, you know what? If you want to save some of our interpersonal problems for off the podcast, that would be super helpful. Because sometimes you and I can get into a mood where we get a little real. And it's time to pull back and see what kind of person you are on stage or off stage, Rob. So please continue with your long-winded answer. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so yeah, so so definitely, I think you, you know your history and your background can kind of create a kind of type. Um, when I was thinking about what are the different kinds of types, we've talked about this before on the podcast. Kind of wanted to flesh it out a little bit more and get your thoughts on an AC, and you can tell me if I'm close or if I'm far away. So I kind of I kind of put this into two different categories for myself, um, which is. Um, your first impulse in a scene, what you want to do, and then kind of what you're doing in the rest of the show. So the first category I created was a category I would just call firsts. People who come in first. I think this is something you see a lot. Are they initiators? Are they, are the people who are walking on stage, are they, for example, perhaps a leader in life who are like initiating scenes? Um, we can think about people who are really good at characters, people who are really good at emotions. You often see them kind of jump out there first because they get to kind of set the stage of what's going to be happening in the scene. I would also describe people who are scene builders to be firsts. So if you're really interested in setting up the who, what, where, creating that kind of structure, um, usually that's what a first does. And, and they're very helpful because they get the show going, they create a momentum. But um, one of the drawbacks about being a first is usually there's something that's tied in, in that with control like an unhealthy first is someone who has to be in first because unless they're creating the story off the top they feel uncomfortable um the second grouping in this i would just say seconds which is pretty intuitive after if we call the first group first so seconds are people who come in and they like to be reactionary within scenes they actually prefer to have someone else kind of walk out there and do something so that they can kind of not necessarily follow, but react to what's happening. And I would consider like, for example, people who are collaborators, like I think AC, I think you are just a natural collaborator with how you play. Like you, you like building off of things. I've seen you do this a, a bunch in shows where someone will come in, they'll set something up and you'll have the second line and it changes the entire fabric of the scene. Mm -hmm. like that's like kind of your superpower. Um, I would say people who are commenters, so people who like to, you know, kind of do, um, what's that thing called? Slow, slow mo Olympics, you know, where there's two people sitting on the side and they're doing a chore in slow motion and they're like commenting on it and making jokes. That commenter is a, as, as a subsection of seconds or people who like to just go on the adventure. So if you're really into story based uh, narrative improv, then maybe you're enjoying the idea of being taken on a journey by someone else, or you're excited to see what that experience is like. You're there to experience the scene, not necessarily write the scene. 
And then the final in this first kind of grouping is what I would just call the cross. And this is someone who doesn't actually necessarily want to be in the scene at all. Maybe this person feels more comfortable walking into the scene or walking by. Um, you and I both played a lot with a guy who loved walking on. It was actually his favorite thing to do because he was so good at characters. A scene would start and then he would just pop in and be like, oh, cool, I'm going to drop into this character. I need to know <laughs> what the scene is so I know what character to pick. So those are like the first three things that I'm thinking about, the different kinds of players you are just from when you want to appear in the scene. So it's far, interesting. what do you think? Yeah, it's interesting because um, I think people fall into these categories and I don't know how many people r recognize it and how many people are like, oh, that's who I am. Maybe that's what I do all the time. And that's great because you probably excel at it. But being able to say, huh, tonight... Or looking around the show I'm doing, there's a lot of firsts here. Huh. Mm. I need to take a step back just for tonight's show, a good challenge for me. But also when I'm thinking about the show as a whole, I need to maybe be able to identify who I am, who the people in my troupe are, and then maybe make some adjustments, right? I always mm. think about improv and sports together just because it's... It is so random. You can rehearse it as much as you want. You can practice as much as you want. But when a game happens or a show happens, and I always think about the opposing team being the audience, you don't know what they're going to enjoy. You don't know what they're going, their plan is. Um, but sometimes when you're on a team and a player that has a specialty, they get injured. And it's mm -hmm. like, hey, Rob, we know you don't normally do this, but Adam's injured. We need you to be a first tonight. Can you do that? And those kinds of like, um, those kinds of challenges, I think really help an improviser to find a purpose in a show that sometimes they could be taking for granted, feeling a little lazy, feeling like, let's just have fun tonight. But finding these little challenges um, and, and giving an improviser purpose, I feel like really elevates their game because there's something they want to accomplish. They don't need anybody else to do anything to help that uh, goal be accomplished so it's not like I'm forcing anyone on my team to change the way they play but for yourself it can be a real advantage to be able to figure this out and then make adjustments accordingly yeah and, and I mean I think it's interesting because there there is there is a limited pie with an improv it seems like it's it's open open season you can do whatever you want but I guarantee if you have seven people who do very big characters and one person who can edit that one person who can edit is going to be the most valuable person on the team like uh, and you're probably missing a couple roles here within this this team right so um you kind of do have to adjust based on what other people are choosing to do like like you and i were on a long form team for 15 years and the roles that people chose to do changed and when when one person decided to change it forced everyone else on the team to either change or have a bad show and after a couple of bad shows people picked up new responsibilities because someone's someone's got to fill that spot right and i think these um these labels that you've identified are super helpful and as you said there's there's many more we haven't touched on because depending on the form you're doing and the size of your team it's like you may have someone that, oh, what they do is they tie things together. Mm -hmm. They're, oh, you're a second beat person. You're a callback person. All mm -hmm. depends on, you're the organic initiator. Like depending on what kind of form you're doing, uh, there's so many things that you can have as kind of like your label. Again, just like any athlete. Mm -hmm. um, so any other any other types that you can think of off the top of your head? Yeah, so... so I talked a little bit about your first impulse into where you want to be within the collaboration. Um, the other thing I could think about is, is for folks who um, are actually in the show and where their head is in the show. So I broke it down to three other categories, which would be the grinder, the director, and the glue player. And the grinder is pretty simple. The, the grinder is the person who 
when they're improvising, they're really just looking at the thing in front of them. So if they're in the scene, they're not thinking about what, the, what will the second beat be? They're playing the scene itself. And um, these people are really useful because they're, they're usually very, very strong actors. They're very good at experiencing the scenes for themselves. They're in it. They're in it 100%. Um, they're present in a way that maybe some of these other players aren't because their brains are thinking about the future or they're thinking about what just happened in the last scene. So the, the grinder really is a person who's in the scene and they're going to keep doing the scene until they're taken somewhere else. The, the opposite of that would be the director. And the director is someone who is um, constantly kind of outside of the, sh the scene that they're doing. They're the ones thinking about second beats, um, tag-ins. They're the ones thinking about connecting the show together. And it manifests in different ways, but this is a person who is really kind of sitting in the front row of the audience, watching the show while they're performing in the show. Um, and to, to be able to play scenes and also kind of direct from within is a very difficult task. And when it's done wrong, it feels like someone's not committing completely because they're, they're actually not in the scenes 100%. Um, and then the final thing is just the glue player. And the glue player is a player that has a magical ability to kind of keep the show together, hold everything together, make everything work in some way. Um, this is the person who's going to jump on their grenade. This is the person that just wants to smooth everything out. They want to reinforce what's already there. And so the glue player works really good between, you know, the grinder and the director, just trying to make sure that everything kind of fits, fits together. So with these two different groups of three, I think you could combine them in different ways. So for example, like you could be, for example, a cross director which would basically mean like you are uh, someone basically walking in and being like, meanwhile, somewhere else, like you may feel more comfortable as the narrator of a show than you are necessarily in the scenes themselves. Um, you could also be, for example, a first director, which means you're in first and you want to kind of shape the whole, use that scene to shape the whole show. Well, that's a very dangerous combination of characteristics because it's very possible that y you are not playing with the person in front of you at all so also with these traits there's like healthy versions of them and then there's also kind of unhealthy versions of them it um it was so funny i was thinking after such and wrote in the question i was thinking mm -hmm. about um playing with people that you don't know and i was doing a show um, at the West Side Theater in, in Santa Monica. And it was with, what's that? I've heard of it. You've heard of it. Um, what's that? I've been there. Great. Um, so, <laughs> uh, before we went on, there, there, there was this question that came up and someone brought it up and they said, hey, so can we just go around and, and give a quick breakdown of how everyone plays? Like, what's your, what's your thing? And I was like, I've never heard of this. And I was like, I don't know what to say. And uh, it was funny because like star of the podcast, Jason Duraz, mm -hmm. he was doing the show and he was like, emotions. And I was like, yeah, Jason brings tons of emotions. Like he, Jason's not going to be a big editor. Jason's not going to be a first, but Jason is going to bring heart and emotion to every scene. I was like, wow, that's great. And so when it came to me, I, I didn't really know what to say, but I I went with I'll look for I'll look for loose ends. Like I'll look to tie things together. And once I said it, I was like, shit, now I have a responsibility. <laughs> and but but having that awareness, I don't know if I would recommend it, but it was just an interesting experience to then watch people try and play up or, or play into what they had announced. And it became very much like, I'm proving that I'm doing it. But it was so funny, personally for me, to watch like, oh shit, now I've got to watch in a certain way. I've got to play in a certain way because I said I would do this thing. But then doing it, felt very satisfying 
Mm. It felt very much like, oh, we all came together. We're this rogue group of soldiers. And we're like, we have a mission. And it's like, what do you do? Okay, cool. I don't have to worry about that then. What do you do? Okay, cool. I'm not good at that. What do you? Oh, you do that too? All right, maybe we avoid scenes with each other just to spread it out. And it was such an interesting way to handle it. And I wanted to bring that to you and just say, have you ever experienced that? Do you have any thoughts? Um, have I experienced that before? I don't think so. Because when you, when you were telling me the story, I felt this like my stomach turn in this way yeah. that I, it hasn't in a long time. I was just like, oh my God, I hate this question. And, and there's nothing wrong with asking it. But, you know, as you're describing it, I'm like, to to break your 20 years of experience down into like a single epithet. Like, I would say, like, like for example, leader in life makes sense. But I think, like, for stuff like improv, it's really, really hard to necessarily break you or Jason down into just one phrase. Is Jason, does Jason bring emotions? A million percent Jason brings emotions. But also there's mischief. Like, he could have said, like, I, I bring mischief. Because also, too, like, his emotions are so inappropriate. Like he's always choosing an emotion that that doesn't fit with what's happening in the scene or it's it's twisting it in a certain way. The way his brain works, he's full of surprises. He's the bringer of surprises and and whimsy and delight in a certain way. I've kind of described him as a kind of um, Dionysian character here. You talking about you you tying up loose ends, I'm like, absolutely. Uh but like you also do so 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 much more than that. Um, when you said tying up loose ends, it came out of your mouth. You're like, I tie up loose ends, and then were you like, oh no, everyone thinks I'm not funny now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I the think lame one. Did, oh no. I think people looked at me like it was like, hey, what? Um, you're playing Goldeneye. You're playing multiplayer, and it's like, hey, Adam, what character do you like? And I was like. I like hooking up the Nintendo. You're like, oh, that's your favorite part about Goldeneye is setting up and Nint- unraveling the controllers yeah. and put, putting them in. Okay. And I was like, damn it. But if I don't set it up, no one can play. So it's worthwhile. But it's like those things of like, Rob, what's your favorite movie? People are like, oh, that's hard. I can't. I, I have so many. And it's like, what kind of improviser are you? Well, it, it all depends. What, am I, what, what kind of show is it? Um, but I think knowing, I think the way you've broken it down in the first section here is a great way to just start to give yourself these kinds of labels. Give yourself the awareness to say, I really lean into this aspect and here's something that I never do. Therefore, maybe I should take a break from the thing I'm already good at. And start to experience the thing that I don't know because maybe I love it. Maybe I'm really good at it. And the only reason I haven't been doing it is because it terrifies me. I think it's a really good point. And I think like, you know, there are pockets within improv that make you feel very, very safe. Like, I don't know why. I don't know what's wrong with me. But for some reason within improv, talking for a long time doesn't bother me. Like, I would be very, very happy if I could walk on stage first and do a big old speech and explain something for a long time. I don't think, I think that would be a good time, not for the audience and not mm-hmm. for the people I'm playing with. No, but for no, me no. personally, that would be a lot of joy. But for me, I'm, I'm, every show I'm always thinking, I want to, I want to react. I want to be taken on the journey. I want to be the kind of player that, um, is in response to someone else's idea where I don't have to control anything. That's what I, that's what I want to be. And so I work on becoming that thing. Um, there were times when we used to play together, which I felt very responsible to edit everything. I felt like I had to direct the whole show. I had to keep the momentum up. If I didn't do it, no one else would. And I just had to be like, I'm not going to do it anymore. And then everyone else stepped up and I got to start playing characters. My brain wasn't focused on how do I make the show move? It was focused on how do I make me move? How do I make the audience like me? How do I create a character that's interesting and dynamic? So I think I think on in some way as a kind of like self analysis, uh, yeah, like a like a self analysis. I think it's it's a great tool. I think as an epithet of who you are as a player, it's quite limiting. 
Because to, to say that you're a player who ties up loose ends, I would just be like, in fact, if I was at a, another show, people like, do you play with Adam Cauley? And they went, oh, yeah, I know that guy. He's the guy who ties up loose ends. I'd be like, excuse me? <laughs> do you know what he can do? Tie up loose ends? You think he's a third beat player? Dude, watch him in a first beat. He'll crush you. What are you talking about? Ties up loose ends. Like, like Thank it's you just for a, coming to my defense. So imaginary defense? Yeah. But it's, it's just such a small sliver of what your capabilities are. And this is like the, the big problem that we as improvisers suffer from. And something that like you and I have talked about before, which is like a, as an improviser, you spend all of this time being okay with every kind of character, with every kind of voice, with every kind of perspective. But you very rarely spend time honing one perspective. You and I have many friends who started at the same time as us, but instead of improv, they chose stand-up. And you'll, you watch them do this for 20 years, and you watch their stand-up, and you're like, oh my gosh, like you've perfected this one singular voice of who you are, and this one singular presentation of yourself in the world. It must be so easy to write jokes. It must be so easy to meet people. It must be so easy to be on stage and know what funny is. Whereas like, I don't know if you ever feel this way, but sometimes I just feel crazy where I'm just like, oh, I've been doing this for 20 years. When I think about like, oh, like what's funny to you? I'm like, well, what's the context? What's the scene? What did the first person say? Right. Then I can think of the funny response. But the idea of like just operating with an open void and be like, tell us your point of view. It's, it's a really hard jump for someone who has erased their point of view so that they could take on other people's. Yeah, it's um, improvisers are morph and stand-ups are cyclops. Oh, this is honestly one of the, the best examples I've ever heard in my life. One million percent. Could I trade... No, I, you know what I was going to say? I was going to say, let's trade Mystique. These are X-Men, by the way, for people who don't know what we're talking about. Let's trade um, Mystique for morph. But then I remembered um, morph dies in episode one of the series and that feels like it's more in line with the paycheck of an improviser uh, so but then Cyclops. years later we find out he was picked up by mr sinister and he mm -hmm. comes back really disgruntled so again mm -hmm. very much like an improviser <laughs> rob what are some things uh Suchin kind of had a, a a secondary part to his question um what are the things that people can do to be better at improv outside of improv, right? We know about taking classes. We know about all that. Um, what are some things to avoid that might hinder your growth as an improviser? So kind of two questions in one there. But I think people are always like, I remember my first Second City audition. I was like, I had no business being there. I think I took a headshot at the balcony of my frat house and uh, with a digital camera, which is really cool at the time. Um, and then they ask you what, um, like, what are you reading right now, Adam? And I was like 19. I was like, I'm reading, um, Mick Napier's book on improv. It's like, okay. And I was like, I thought that's what I should say. I'm at a second city audition. Um, so what do you think? What are some things that people do outside that can help? And what are some things that people do that actually kind of hinder? Well, I mean, I think this is an interesting question because you just brought up Second City. And I'm like, well, how good of an improviser do you need to be to work at Second City? I'd say, like, pretty good. Um, but if you're talking about just straight-up improv, like, you're not trying to use it to get on TV. You're not trying to use it to make sketches. You just want to get good at improv. Then I think young Adam Colley was doing the right thing. It's about reading improv books. It's about um, going to shows. Most importantly, I think it's about, and I'm not joking, I think it's about buying a bottle of Glenlivet and sitting around with your friend and talking about it. I, I, I definitely do. There's this chapter in um, Gladwell's, maybe it's Blink, where it talks about this study that people did with guitarists who didn't have access to their guitar, but they asked them to close their eyes and imagine that they were playing the guitar. And they said, skill-wise, it was the equivalent of practicing with the guitar. 
that their brains kind of working through the, the, the different gestures, the different fingerings was the same as holding the guitar itself. And I feel like when we're talking about improv, strategizing, talking about shows, talking about what worked, what, talking about what didn't work, talking about different things that you could have said, you are really training your, your brain to kind of work through the fantasy space. And that's exactly what you, you need to be able to utilize when you're improvising. So I think those are good things for you to do. I've heard other advice like read a bunch of books and get a huge reference level. I don't know, man. I read a bunch of books. I have a huge reference level. People find it annoying. <laughs> it hasn't helped me. I think, um, yeah, I think for the first part, um, it's true. I, I think there is something in the idea of knowledge is power, right? That old phrase that we would hear at the beginning of every video game, like stay in school, knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. um, but being, being so well versed in the thing that you love, it really gives you a confidence of... I can kind of handle anything. I've been through it. I know, oh, you're from this theater. I know what that means. Oh, here's an audience. It's on a Tuesday. I know what that means. I know what a second show Saturday means because it's, oh, it's late night. This is the alcohol. I get it. And so having, having the space or the community to go through the nitty gritty, the, the real nerdy stuff about improv I think it just has some things click in your brain that once you've done that, you feel like, well, that part of improv now that we've really gone into it doesn't intimidate me anymore. It doesn't, now that I've talked to people, like, what do you think when this happens? What, what do you recommend when this happens? How do you approach this example? And really going through that stuff, it just felt like it, it made me feel less alone and less nervous and much more like, oh, other people love this as much as me. Oh, mm -hmm. I feel empowered and I feel supported. I think the things like reading a bunch of newspapers <laughs> um, is, a, is not the right phrasing, but I think it's just making sure you have other interests, whatever that is. Something that occupies your time occupies your energy that has nothing to do with improv i don't think it matters what it is but just being able to not get to a place where um you've got too much of a good thing right yeah can i you've got ice I cream for dinner there? ice cream for dessert what i should add on to that because i think you're right you just nailed something really important you and i came up and we were both told the same fucking story which is one guy, and we're probably thinking of the exact same guy, would go, you know, when I was on main stage, what I would do is I'd read the newspaper on the streetcar, and that's the whole show. That's everything I needed for the improv show. Did you ever hear that story? Tell it, though. Yeah. No, that that's the story. He would <laughs> brag about reading the newspaper on the way to his show, and, like, being well-read is so important. But... And, and maybe at Second City, when you're constantly trying to m make social and political satire, that's necessary. I I'm not sure. I actually, as a director, I'd probably say that's not quite true. Often people would come in with premises that they pull it up a newspaper. And I'd go, what do you want to do with it? And they'd go, I don't know. <laughs> isn't isn't this is what you do? Uh, apparently there's an oil spill. I go, okay, what's your opinion on it? And they go, eh, I don't care about it. I'm like, okay, well, this Bad? isn't helpful. <laughs> It's not good. But I, I think the thing that is important is that you have a rich inner life. And so I, like, we have a friend who just loves video games. He's not going to give you a lecture on, you know, Edward Said, but like he can tell you everything about science fiction. He can tell you everything about like these video games that he's playing. And when he gets on stage to improvise, he gets to be inside of a video game. And that's, that's his rich inner life. We talked about star of the podcast, Jason DeRoss. He was a semi-professional snowboarder. He was like on the cusp of like, I think he was sponsored, but almost like was making a full-time living off of this. When he improvises, he has this rich inner life where he's like, what trick can I pull off? So if that's reading, awesome. 
if it is doing an activity that inspires you in that way, awesome. You just want to make sure that you're full of something that you want to share with the world. And however you get that is great. But this idea that you need to be able to do a TED Talk to be good at improv, I just don't buy it. I don't think that's true. Um, don't. Don't. I mean, don't have a job. <laughs> Are we... I mean, Wait, that's a, I'm being that's flipping a here. Do, but do not have a job. Don't do not have a job. Don't have a job. I mean, like, like if, if I'm being flippant about this, I would say like the more time you can spend thinking about improv and doing improv and making improv your life, you're going to be better at this than someone who's doing that and also working 60 hours a week. It's just the way it is. Um, yeah. Uh, making your, your friend group, the improv community makes you better at improv because it's you're going to just happen to play more shows. You're going to be invited to more shows. You're going to see more people. Um, and what are some so things that you feel hinder that? It's like, what are the things that you'd be like, oh, try and stay away from this because um, that's not going to help you? I mean, I, th I think, I think, yeah, I, I would say... Um, Sometimes people can use the improv community to also kind of fill the kind of social gap for us. Like, for example, you might move to a new city and, yeah, all the improvisers become all of your friends. Well, that's great. That's good. But also I would say, like, you're, you're there to get good at improv. You're not there to drink. You're not there to party. You're not there to, like, you know, hang out. You're there to improvise. So, you know, I think socializing is a big part of it. I think schmoozing is a big part of improv. But I think you could spend more time on stage, probably less time at the bar, probably. So just as we're wrapping up here and you're thinking about style of improviser, mm -hmm. I think what's really interesting, especially now where, you know, people can train with anyone, anywhere, at any time, you being a certain kind of player, it just may not work with another group of people, right? So say you're, you're a UCB that's where you came from. That's where you learned everything. And then you're doing a show randomly with the five people from the annoyance. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, well, some of my verbiage of base reality, first unusual thing, framing, heightening, all of that. It's like an annoyance player just might be like, oh, I'm coming in as asshole dad. That's all I got. So I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, are there any tips where you feel like, oh, I can, I can adjust either the way I play or I can become more of a Swiss army knife of an improviser so that it doesn't really matter what training you all have where I'm, who I'm playing with, I can fit in. I can make this work by doing some simple things or some, some clear, distinct things that are kind of more universal. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I feel like I could imagine if you're from Loose Moose or IO or UCB, Second City even, uh, I, I could imagine you showing up to play with someone and being confused or panicked because they don't want to do the same thing that you are doing. I think it's, I, I don't know if the annoyance player in this example would care at all who they're playing with. I don't think it would matter at all. <laughs> and I think... I think we can channel a lot of that confidence. You know, if I'm playing with someone who plays differently than me, this is this is the C plus. This is the basic level for me. You show up and you go, I'm okay. You're okay. I'm allowed to do whatever I want. And you're allowed to do whatever you want. And it's probably 90% chance that this is going to probably work out. It'll be really exciting to see and surprising to see how it works out. Um, and if it doesn't work out, well, that's interesting too. I'm going to learn a lot about my craft and what my limits are of my skills outside of my home theater. But the A plus, the mastery of this, it isn't tolerance. It's, it's like being energized by it. So I walk out on stage and instead of going, oh, I'm playing with someone from UCB. I'm not going, it'll be okay. It'll be fine. I go, good. This is exactly what I want. I want to play with someone from UCB. And I want them to say offers that don't make any sense to me. <laughs> and 
And I want to react to that. I can't wait for that. And it's going to be messy. I want that mess. I want to see what happens. I'm excited for that. Like the, the fact that you would be energized by someone doing something different than you is exactly what I think you would, you would want. Uh, and just trust that like for the most part, we may be learning different terms. We may be playing in different styles. There might be different procedures. But I would say even if you don't know any of the procedures or styles, um, you're probably going to be able to figure it out. You're probably going to be able to um, have a great show. I don't know, AC, if I ever told you this, but I, I always had a fantasy. This is oh. my dream, and it never happened Ooh. for me. Is you this safe for say- work? Yeah, it's fine. Nice. It's about improv. Oh. So I'm, I'm fucking all these scenes, right? Wait, you know, what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, in Second City, we, we have this process, which we call The Process, mm. where uh, um, a show ends and a new show begins, and we, we're kind of phasing out different scenes. And not all the scenes are quite written when they go into the process. So you could have a half-finished scene in the show. During this time, you're not allowed to take days off unless you're sick. I had a dream of when I was understudying main stage. What I wanted to have happen was that, like, you or someone else got sick in a Wait. whole brand new sketch show. Yeah, you were, like, really sick. Like, you're dying, Wait. right? And I would, like, do these, like, little uh, prayers because I made these little effigies of you. Oh. But you would get very sick and you're dying. You're dead. Okay. And you would... The understudy would have to go in and they'd be like, listen, he got sick 45 minutes before showtime. We don't even have the materials. We didn't write down the script. Rob, you're going to do the sketch show, but you have to improvise every scene. And we'll just see what happens. And I was like, that, that would be my dream. That would be so fun to do. Where it's like, we're doing this like, like very polished, awesome show. And you have no responsibility. Just enjoy two hours of putting on wigs and doing silly characters. Um, that's the what's idea happening that when would, you... Go ahead. It would be such a blast because I don't know if we've talked about it, but that sounds great. Like, I love that idea. Because when, when I was understudying, there was uh, a cast member. They were in the process. And a cast member, um, him and his wife were about to have a baby. And I was like, oh, if, if my baby comes, like, I'm not doing the show. <laughs> And they were like, well, Second City, um, as cool as they can be, were like, well, Adam, you're the understudy. Um, just get ready. And I was like, okay, well, that's my job. Uh, what are the scripts? And they're like, well, we don't have any scripts because the show's not written. It's like, uh-huh. So sorry, what, what are you asking me to do? And so I would have to go and watch the show and the set and just sit there and try to absorb as much as possible in case I have to go in. It never ended up happening. But looking back, like, what a nightmare. Like, now, the idea that you and I are talking about sounds great. Because we've, we've gone through that. We've, we've moved past it. But in the moment, as a young man, it's quite terrifying. And I've done scenes where uh, it's gone wrong. Um, and it's an awful feeling. But the idea of... Hey, Rob, here's the premise. Like, we're about to go on stage. It's basically, um, we're a couple and um, we're trying to get money off of our mortgage. Ready? Let's go. Mortgage agent is a liar. Here we go. It's like, that sounds like the thrill of a lifetime. Of like, you all have something in your head. My only responsibility is to improvise here. That sounds amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds cool. <laughs> Great story. <laughs> That's all. Um, So, Rob, any other thoughts of being um, kind of the the improviser as an individual, how to figure out what you are, what you bring to a show, and what you need to make adjustments? I think you should invest in a $35 stand for your phone. Go on. Go on Amazon and buy a $35 stand for your phone. And I think you should record your sets. And I think you should watch them. And I think oh. you should see how the audience sees you. And I think you should think, this is a really hard 
kind of uh, dialogue between you and yourself, especially with your own shame, is going, is the guy who's on stage right there um, who I want to be? Mm. And like most of the time, the answer is no. And it it it's, takes um... a very long time as an improviser for you to go like, I did that show. That's who I am. I like that. I like who that is. I bombed. I still like that guy. That's a really hard place to get to. If you've never watched a show um, that you loved doing, mm -hmm. check it out. Because the next day, it's rough. Like, it can be difficult to watch even the shows that are incredible. The shows that suck go in there knowing it's going to be even worse watching it recorded. But the shows that are great, there's just all of these, like, you're going through it with blinders on. You don't see the full picture. And that's why you love having a coach or a director for anything you put on stage. When you're in it, it's such a different experience than watching it. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Record it, take a look at yourself, and just be like, oh, reality check. That's what I bring. I had no idea. Um, a side note of this, you and I spent some time in L.A. just after Dallas. We were hanging out. And so we had to do some auditions together. And you taught me a lot. Um, not about acting. Um, oh. But you would do your auditions and you would watch back the tape. Mm -hmm. And I would watch you watch yourself. And the moments that you enjoyed, you would, like, celebrate. And you'd be like, oh, that's great. Like, oh, nice. Good job. And then I was like, ah, uh, yeah, I, I don't feel good about auditioning. And I would go do my tape, and then you would watch it back, and you'd be like, oh, wow, that this part's great. Oh, you'd watch it back, and you would laugh. And I was like, oh, like, Adam's, like, enjoying this process. He's celebrating his wins. Like, he's, he's pointing out parts where he's failing, but he's also celebrating his wins. And if you don't celebrate your wins within this process, then you're just, you're just on a grindstone. You, you only got a short lifespan. You can't sustain that forever. So going back and watching and celebrating when you do well and laughing and learning to love yourself, that's what keeps you in the game. I love it. Robbie, Thanks, Adam. on stage, off stage, what is going on with you that is exciting you? My favorite TV show of all time. Do you know what it is? Or my favorite comedy of all time. Do you know what it is? I don't. British Office. You don't oh, care about okay. I thought you were talking about a new British show. And Office. I was like, you have a new show? No. No. I'm talk I was asking like as a friend, what's my favorite comedy show? Oh, yeah. It's British Office. And it's so easy just to be like, man, Ricky Gervais kills it. No, oh, man. Like watching his stand-up now, I'm just like, oh, I do not like this guy. It's not my not my jam at all. I loved him so. I loved you so much in the office. I loved you in extras. Like, like what's missing here? I'll tell you what's missing. It's fucking Stephen Merchant, man. That guy fucking rocks. That guy's my favorite guy in the whole world. I love Stephen Merchant. Uh, I'm going to. Everything he does is just the best. Everything except for that weird mutant he played in Logan is just the best. And uh, he has a new show, not a new show out. The second season just came out, but the first season's out called The Outlaws. Do you know about the show? No. It's a BBC show. It's Stephen Merchant's in it. Uh, Christopher Walken's in it. It's about a bunch of people who commit petty crimes and have to do community service. Yes. Okay. I've seen posters for it. Now I know what you're talking about. So one of the main characters uh, is... Uh, the, the woman who is like the parole, not parole officer, corrections agent, perhaps is the name. Oh, I forget her name. I got. I should look it up. She's so incredible in this show. And I'm going to tell you right now, pure David Brent vibes. I'm watching it going, oh man, like this, this woman is like as good as R Ricky Gervais. She's like channeling a lot of Ricky Gervais. I'm like, wait a second. Is the thing... Is the Ricky Gervais I liked in The Office, is even that a construct of Stephen Merchant? <laughs> Basically, I think everything I like about The Office was invented by Stephen Merchant. I think he's just the best guy in the world. Anyways, it's a funny show. Lots of heart. That The heart is so important because you can't, you can't have mean unless you balance it with heart. So there's a lot of heart and there's a lot of very good jokes, uh, great mix of characters. 
enjoying it a lot. And what's it on? It is on the TV. On the TV. Okay, cool. So you just press play. It. Amazon. Just fucking I Google think. it. Amazon Whatever. Prime. Rob's over it. What about you, AC? Um, I love it. Well, Robbie, thank you so much. Uh, I want to hear what what do people think about um, how they identify as an improviser? What do you recognize in your community as like, ooh, here's one that we haven't mentioned. I want to hear all about that. You can always reach out to us at The Backline Pod on Facebook and Twitter, at The Backline Podcast on Instagram. We're getting a lot of fun um, messages from people all around the world uh, recently finding this Instagram. Um, it just seems that people are possibly into the pictures. And whoever's posting those pictures and taking those pictures, I think, is getting a lot of compliments. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to check out the Instagram for the person who, like, has all these great pictures, stuff like that. Um, and uh, this podcast, as always, it brought to you by who, Robbie? It's brought to you by the Sonar Network. And if you like this podcast, uh, feel free to subscribe. Write a comment so that other people can find us. Robbie, you have been a nightmare as always. And we will see you next week. <laughs>